Hi, this is Cherry Davis, and I'm talking to Sujet Varagis, who's the star <laughs> of the new show Transplant, airing on NBC in America. How are you doing today? Hey, Cherry, good. How are you? So this is a good, a good chance to give you a lesson on how to say my name. It's <laughs> Sujet Varagis. Sujet Varagis. Perfect. <laughs> I am so sorry. I practice. I even listened to other interviews and I tried to write it phonetically. Um, I'm, I'm, I always find um, other people's names fascinating. Um, so tell me about yours. You had said that um, your parents named you a traditional name. Well, I, you know, I'm born, I was born in India, in a part of India that is actually a very large concentration of people of Christian faith going back to the time of Christ. So Varagis is actually a Christian name, and it means George, like St. George. Uh, and, and my father's first name is George, and my mother's first name is Susan, because it's all biblical names. So they decided to give me a traditional Indian name, Sujit, which is normally spelled S-U-J-I-T, uh, and spell it S-U-G-I-T-H, so that it was Susan with George. <laughs> that is so sweet. <laughs> You got that had... creativity out with me because <laughs> my younger sisters are named Liz and Tina. <laughs> well, you must be their favorite son because they, um, I bet your parents met cute because that is such a cute name, tying their names together. I love it. I love it. Um, so I have to say I'm been, I've been very impressed by you because I consider you to be a Renaissance man. You're a screenwriter, um, you're a director and an actor. Um, how did you start your career in the um, creative fields? Well, I, I broke into television in Canada as a, a writer. Uh, I was still in film school and I sold my first script to Canada's public broadcaster, the CBC, and it was an episode of a, uh, a spy show. And that's how I started. I, I, I really planned to be a writer. Um, and then I think the second or third thing I wrote was a movie for CBC and this is going back many, many years, 30 years. Uh, and it was about sort of my, well, it came from my uh, cultural background. Uh, it was about an Indian guy who grew up in Canada and he had, a white, he had a white girlfriend that his parents didn't know about. And he didn't know they were arranging a marriage for him with a girl from India and, you know, hijinks ensue. But we couldn't find an actor. And uh, so uh, they sent the casting director to LA and this is in the early 80s, to find an, a brown actor to play this part. And she came back, this is, you know, and said, I found him. And we said, who? Because well, I didn't know of any Indian actors in LA, let alone Canada. She said, well, he's a very funny guy, because this was a comedy. He's a stand-up comedian named Howie Mandel. And I went, well, wait, what? what? That's not an Indian name. <laughs> and, but, you know, they, that was the best they could do. And so, I begged them to let me audition because it, you know, I just couldn't imagine this show that I was so invested in from coming from my own cultural experience and telling this story to then have, I am not an untalented guy, but not, you know. So I auditioned for my own movie and I got the part and that's how I started acting. And so since then I've been writing and acting um, you know, some years writing is higher and some years acting is higher. So it's, it's good to diversify. And I was the first minority to go to the Canadian Film Center founded by Norman Jewison, which is our American Film Institute. And so that's when I started directing and been, uh, you know, surviving ever since. Well, first of all, you do not look like you would have written a movie 30 years ago. I love your skincare routine because you look as young as me. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I have no skincare routine other than having great parents. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so funny. And I'm definitely going to follow up on that because I think it's really important for representation and for people to see themselves. And one of my big frustrations is how actors are being, re um, ethnic characters are being played by non-ethnic people and then they brown their skin. Um, in America, I don't know if they do that very often in uh, Canada as much. Uh, so, um, no. <laughs> well, that's. I, I'd have something to say. I'd call up the union if I saw that happening. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, they're still doing it. Um, 
so when you landed the role of Dr. Ajay Singh, how was the process? Did it do a traditional um, um, casting call or did the director or someone say, I know the perfect person for this role and here we are? Well, I was very lucky it was option B. Uh, 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 the, you know, I, I've been doing this quite a while as you, as you point out. <laughs> And, uh, and I, had, I had worked with the director of the pilot a couple of times and uh, the producer, I knew, quite, knew, knew me quite well. And I think uh, Holly, who was the director of the pilot suggested me for the part. And as soon as that happened, they went, oh, that's a good idea. And you know, everybody knew my work. So they just called me up and said, uh, can you do this? And I went, sure. And I had no idea about the role, about the show, about other than it was a hospital show. And, uh, you know, and I went, oh gosh, here we go. I'm playing another doctor. And this would be my, I think, 25th TV doctor. Uh, but I was unbelievably pleasantly surprised when I read the first couple of scripts. I went, oh, this is like a not an uninteresting doctor. Okay, I can, I can get my, I can get my teeth into this. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a lovely offer and uh, I was grateful to accept. Now, how did you um, personalize the role? Were you able to bring your own history, uh, friendship <laughs> with doctors, or did you do research? Because his personality is definitely a non-traditional Indian doctor role that I see in the U.S. Right. Well, <laughs> first of all, I come from a family of doctors. I mean, Indian <laughs> kids, you know. My father was a brain surgeon. His father was a doctor. My uncle was a doctor. I have two cousins who are doctors. And thankfully my middle sister below me is a doctor. So I in fact did a pre-med drama double major at university expecting to apply for medical school. So I did all the pre-med courses. I just never got around to applying to medical school. Um, so I, I come by that honestly. I, I would say that uh, I didn't I didn't really use my father as a role model for Dr. Singh because he's a much nicer doctor or he, he's passed now, but he was a much I'm nicer, sorry. much nicer doctor in a way than uh, Dr. Singh appears to be. You haven't seen the whole season yet, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, I do, tr well, first of all, it's always in the writing. Uh, I, I, I can't, um, you know, bring anything that isn't in the writing already. What my job is to elevate the writing to being alive, right? To being real and truthful and honest. And, and it was on the page. I mean, this guy, you know, I said to Joe, our showrunner, when I, I got onto the set for the first time, uh, I said, well, you know, here's the, here's the senior surgeon who crushes dreams, right? <laughs> and, and he said, I guess. Uh, and I said, and I said to him, but he's not wrong. And Joe said, yes, that's right. He's not wrong. <laughs> so he may not be, you know, uh, a, uh, a warm, cuddly guy, but he's coming from a real place of integrity, you know? So, uh, so with that, you know, I kind of take my lead from the writing and then try and <clears throat> I tried to bring my own spin on it. I mean, there are sometimes a role model here and there, uh, I remember going on rounds with my father when I was in university because he wanted me to film a little operation that he did because it was a unique kind of procedure and he wanted to get it on film and I had a movie camera. So I got to see him in action. I met other doctors in a hospital, you know, not, in, not at home coming for dinner, but in the, in the field, so to speak. So, you know, you see people like this and I have talked to enough uh, people about the show since it's been on, they say, oh, that Dr. Singh, I work with one of those guys, you know, <laughs> people who work in hospitals. So I'm, I'm glad that it, it resonates that, you know, that, that kind of doctor isn't, uh, is not unknown. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and I'm also thrilled that, as you point out, he's, he's an Indian doctor or of Indian origin. He's not, quote unquote, a nice guy. And I think that's great. You know, I think it's important for, for uh, diverse characters to not always be nice, noble, wonderful, but they have to be real and human and not necessarily the, 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 the you know, 
the perfect person. And that, and that actually does more to tell the truth, which is what we're really trying to do, whether you're talking about diverse casting or creating these parts, is to tell the truth. Uh, I mean, what we're fighting against is the fact that the you know television was sort of whitewashed for so long, and and my people and your people weren't there as the doctors and the lawyers and the you know I mean and and yet they are in real life. So that's the truth, and the truth should be a full truth, not just a you know a nice truth, but a real truth. And I think that's what they've done with Doctor Singh, and I'm happy to be the figurehead for that. I'm super excited to have discovered Transplant. Um, I watch a lot of TV shows on streaming networks. And so I usually have to look and find diverse um, led uh, series. And I was spinning through NBC's app to look for um, an episode of a show that I watched. And all of a sudden I was like, there's an ethnic person who's dressed up <laughs> like a doctor. What, what show is this? And the minute I found the, uh, the first premiere episode, I fell in love with all of you because I feel like it's welcoming me into someone else's home and seeing some some people of such different ethnicities. I don't know about in Canada, but in the US, often we will have just one ethnic person in a TV show, maybe mm -hmm. two, but this one is so much more diverse. What is it like to have been on that set with such a diverse cast with people from different backgrounds? Well, first thing, that is not, that is very common in hospitals. My dad is a brain surgeon, right? So in Canada, there's so many uh, uh, healthcare workers from diverse backgrounds and it, you go into a, any hospital and, you know, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. I grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and my dad was the neurosurgeon in Saskatoon and that hospital was full of, of non-white people even when I was a kid. So this is very typical, and that and and the story that that they're telling in Transplant, uh, not so much the refugee coming to being a doctor. That is that is a pretty heroic uh, storyline. But just the diversity of that of that hospital is is they're, they're not pushing any buttons there. They're just that's like turning the camera on in any Canadian hospital at any rate. Um, but but just the story about coming onto the set. You know, I shot the very first scenes for the entire series. And I think it was a couple of weeks before I got to, we shoot in Montreal. It's a big sound stage in Montreal, it's a set. And, um, and I got to Montreal and I did my fitting. And then the next day I was filming this show and I've, I've read the first three scripts and that's as much as I know. And I walk onto the set and I can't, I mean, you've seen the show. It looks like a real hospital, I think on TV. Well, when you're on that set, you feel like you're in a real hospital. Like I've been on a lot of sets in my career as an actor. And if you turn the corner, you see that it's a flat and it's held up by sandbags and there's ropes and all this kind of stuff. On our transplant set, it is real, everything. The walls don't move, the floor is real, the ceiling is real, everything works. The operating room is real. Uh, and, and I asked the crew, I said, how big is this thing? And, uh, and they said, well, we were prepping yesterday and we, we tracked ourselves on our Fitbits and it was 13 kilometers we walked. Wow, that's, that's how big it is. <laughs> it is enormous. And so what that does for me as an actor and I think for the other cast members is you don't have to act. You don't have to act like you're in a hospital, you're in a hospital. And that just makes, I think the truth telling even easier and, and better. Um, so, it, you know, it's, 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 an ex, it's an amazing, amazing experience to be part of this show and to work on that set. Now, I know the show has already um, run its full course in Canada. Were you able to watch it with your family? Did they offer any comments about your playing a doctor again? Uh, well, <laughs> well um, you know, at this point, they've seen me play a doctor, you know, 25 times. So they were pleasantly, they were sort of surprised that, and you know, my, my sister who is a doctor, she was not happy with my, with my character. She said, you know, that guy, we would have a talk with him, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, uh, uh, but I, you know, I think they were, I, my sister, she's the biggest worry that for me because she knows the truth, right? She's a doctor. 
And uh, I once sent her, uh, you haven't seen the episode yet, so I don't want to spoil it, but I once sent her a photograph from the operating room set and she took a look at my selfie, it was a selfie, and she could figure out the entire case history of, this, of the patient looking at that selfie. That's how authentic it was for her as a doctor looking at, looking at it. So I'm very proud of that and the, and the reality and the authenticity that we've put into the show, it's, it's all on the screen. It looks really good. I didn't realize that the sets were so well. I've been on a few sets normally, they're not quite as solid as what you described. So that must be a lot of fun. Now I was looking forward to your next episode that I'll get to enjoy. And I believe it's going to be called Birth and Rebirth on October 27th here in uh, the US on NBC. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what Dr. Singh will be up to in that episode without giving any spoilers? Well, I think that's the episode where I sent the selfie from set to my sister. <laughs> And it's a it's a big uh, it's a big episode in terms of the story. Uh, uh, we're faced with a real tough tough case, and it's a case where and that's what I love about the show. You know, um, uh, there is personal interaction between the cat like between the doctors and the nurses and all that on the show, but that's not where the bulk of this show lives. The show lives in the cases, you know, and, and it's almost like a mystery show, you know, it's like a police drama where you're trying to figure out who done it, except it's not a, it's not a murderer, it's a disease, right? And, and, uh, and so there's a, there's a, a real focus on the, on the cases. And I, and I find that, I find that so interesting to watch. Um, now, when we're, doing it, what this means is, like for instance, for that episode that you mentioned that's coming up, they brought me in two days early to learn how to do the operation. And they bring in all of us early and we, we train with um, medical professionals so that, you know, I, I mean, I could assist on a couple of, if this acting thing doesn't work out, you know, I asked our expert, I said, listen, if it doesn't work out, said, yeah, yeah, you can assist with me next time because you really have to learn all the procedures and, and to do it in a way that looks like you've been doing it for years oh my um, gosh. and in, on camera. So, so you know, they, they, they are taking the time to teach us all of that stuff. And I think that uh, really enhances the, the, again, the truth telling on, on our show. But that episode is a big one. I, I have a lot of people, bring your Kleenex is what I'm gonna say. Oh, no. I will definitely have my Kleenex ready and I might even indulge myself in a glass of red wine. So how many doctors are working with you all on the set to train you? Because the cast looks like it's a good enough, a good enough amount of people where I guess you probably have like two or three medical professionals working with different people. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I work mostly with one uh, who's actually a surgical nurse named Caroline Banks. Uh, she's at, I think she's at Montreal Jewish General Hospital, but she was on set to train me for most of my work. But Hamza Haq, who's our star, um, he has other uh, uh, medical professionals who train him partic particularly. Um, our supervising producer's father I don't know if they paid him, but he was an unofficial uh, 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 advisor because he's a doctor. Um, so yeah, there's there are at least uh, four or five rotating um, professionals that work on. You know, it's, it de depends on the show, depends on the case, and depends on what what we need to to learn. But they're there, and and usually there's at least one person on the set all, at all times to make sure that what you know, even how you're holding your hands for putting the gloves on, you know, like that, they're very strict on because they want it. There's a real method that has to be done. And, you know, they see a lot of TV shows where the actors aren't doing it right. And they can <laughs> tell that they're actors and they don't want us to look like actors. So they're pretty strict about all that stuff. Now, the episodes I've seen here in the U.S., you haven't really worked much with Dr. Hamed. You've mostly worked with Dr. Curtis. Um, as the episodes, as the series goes on, will you be um, interacting more with the other surgeons and doctors and nurses? Well, I hope I'm not giving anything away, but season one is really been the story between Dr. Singh and Dr. Curtis. 
um, and that expands as the season grows. Um, you know, we are renewed for season two. We haven't been able to start filming yet because of COVID. We would have started back in the summer. So we're still delayed on that. I haven't seen any of those scripts, so I couldn't tell you. I'm hoping I keep <laughs> throwing hints at the writer saying, hey, you know, how about a scene with Hamza? But, uh, um, but we'll see. But yeah, season one is really, uh, as far as my character is concerned, was the storyline and the, and the growth between those, uh, her, him and, uh, and June. And he's her mentor is how I looked at it. Um, sort of- Well, to guide more her. than a mentor, he's her boss. She reports directly to him in the, uh -huh. in the, in the hierarchy of the hospital. Okay. She, she has to, she answers to him. Oh. Um, so, so yeah, he's, he's not only, he, he is, a, he may be a mentor, but he's definitely her boss. <laughs> I did notice that when he told her what to do and she she jumped uh, to do it immediately. <laughs> um, well, congratulations on season two. I hope COVID is not um, impacting you that badly since you probably have family members who are able to give you very good advice because some people are getting some really false stuff off of the internet. <laughs> no, I mean, my sister, like I said, who's the doctor is, is kind of in charge of what, uh, what the family is. Unfortunately, she's pretty strict on it. Like she and my mother live in BC, which is across the country. And, uh, and my other sister lives in Alberta, again, also across the country. So I haven't been able to see them since uh, COVID has started. Uh, and my mother being elderly, you know, we're, we're very protective of her. And, and, you know, my sister says, look, I'm, I don't really don't want you to risk flying, uh, not because you might get sick, but you might pick something up on a plane and give it to our mom. And so uh, for the time being, we, we've, we've been, you know, very socially distanced, unfortunately. Well, hopefully um, you can do a Zoom holiday season with your family, which is what I thought I'm doing with mine because mine live outside of California as well. Um, well, I have to say, I've known you for a long time. I first met you on a series called Little Mosque on the Prairie, which streamed in the US on Netflix. And then I met you again. I think it was on, on Hulu. I think it was, it was on, on Hulu. Hulu. Hulu? Yeah, yeah, not Netflix. I'm pretty I have sure. so many streaming yeah, no. services <laughs> to keep them apart. And then I watched you live when you were on the strain. And of right. course, I'm loving you on Kim's Convenience. I love the roles that you select because they're not traditional roles that they give people of your ethnicity. Do you make a, a conscious effort to pick certain types of roles? You know, I wish the business was so easily, you know, defined that I get to pick and choose like what <laughs> I want to do. But I'll tell you the story uh, of both of those shows you mentioned, uh, Little Mosque on the Prairie. Now, Little Mosque is an interesting show because it started in 2006, I think. And at that time, you know, this is post 9-11, here's a show that centers around small Muslim community in a small prairie town. And, uh, and the sort of, and it was a sitcom and, it, you know, this show was so radical at the time and so denounced, I don't, you don't, may not remember, by America, that the first season they had the cast on CNN, people yelling at them, how dare you do a show that makes Muslims look nice. Um, and while we were doing the show, which was from 2000, I was on from starting the second season. So 2007, and I was done by season five, 2011, it was seen in 80 countries around the world. The only country it wasn't seen was the United States. And it only got on Hulu years after it was finished in, in seeing in other countries. Uh, it was only a few years ago that it was on Hulu. Now, uh, that's the, uh, just my political thing. <laughs> about, you know, what that show was really changing. I thought it was changing the world in terms of, at the time, showing Muslims in a positive light and, and you know, really trying to change the, 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 the narrative on, on who people like that were. Um, <clears throat> I was originally cast in that show to do one episode and the chemistry between me and the character of Bubba, who was a series regular, 
was so good that they kept bringing me back. And I ended up doing 19 episodes of that, of that show. Um, a similar thing happened on, on Kim's Convenience that you mentioned. Uh, I originally auditioned for a part <clears throat> when the show was about to start filming, um, which I didn't get. And he was a friend of Mr. Kim. And then about halfway through the filming of season one, they called my agent and said, you know, there's this other part and we'll show the network his additional or his original audition. And if they like it, they'll come in to do this other part in one episode. Uh, is that okay? And he said, yeah, okay, sure. So they called him the next day, okay, he's gonna do this other part. And, uh, and it was one episode and I went in and it was Mr. Meta. Um, and the good thing was that Paul, the lead of Kim's Convenience and I had done a movie about six months earlier together. And we'd spent one night out on a street you know, fooling around while they were filming because the camera was really on the other character, but we improvised our own little movie for about five hours. So we got to know each other and our, we had good chemistry. You know what I mean? Like by the time we got around. So they called me into to, re to rehearse with Paul and we did our scene and I rehearsed. And after I got home, they called my agent and said, we're booking him for two more episodes. So I, I and I, when I got the scripts for those two episodes, I saw that the dialogue from that, those later episodes was the same as what I had auditioned for that original part. So what had happened was they had, they had decided that didn't work out and they were transferring all of that to this new Mr. Meta character. And I've been a recurring character ever since, but I wasn't, I didn't, you know, expect to be. So show business, you know, so you can't count on anything, but I'm very grateful that it worked out. I love Kim's convenience. I discovered that on a streaming uh, channel too. I think it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix and in the US, yeah. I thought that your interaction with uh, Mr. Kim and Mr. Meta is hilarious because like that friend, uh, rival, and mm -hmm. they always have such good lines. Grumpy um, Asian men. <laughs> they are grumpy old men, but funny grumpy old men. You, your career has been fascinating. Some of the things I've never really seen because I haven't seen them in the US, I didn't realize um, about the little mosque on the prairie in the US. I must admit, it sort of went over my head and I didn't discover it till years later. Um, I do know as an American, we often do, ever since 9-11, you really don't have a lot of positive um, Muslim portrayal on TV. It's gotten a little bit better in the last couple of years. Um, but even before that, America is very strange about um, showing ref, um, ethnic people. And mm -hmm. so they kind of don't have as much. Whenever I watch shows from Canada, it feels like um, they're more inclusive. And well, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I was in a, a, an episode of a show that um, showed on both uh, a Canadian network and a US network. And I was playing the air traffic controller in the country of Mauritius. And Mauritius is a very interesting country because the people there are of Indian background, but it was a French colony. So they speak English in a very interesting accent that's a combination of sort of French and Hindi. You know, like if you have an Indian accent or a French accent, you combine those two, that's how the people of Mauritius speak. So I got this part and I went, man, I, I found somebody from Mauritius so I could learn this accent. And I told my friend who was the assistant director on the show, good news, I'm, I'm gonna nail this accent before we film. And he says, hang on. And I hear him put the phone down and I hear yelling in the background is uh, no accent, no accent. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> the guy's Mauritius in Mauritius, you know, like he would have an accent. Uh, no, no, no. The show's shown on a U.S. network and their audience, they don't want anybody to have an accent. <laughs> so if you watch the show, you have this Mauritian air traffic controller who speaks English because that's what air traffic control uh, that's the lingua franca of, of air traffic control, sounding Canadian, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> because because the U.S. network just can't. And I found that with my on-camera roles, that if it's for a Canadian show, I often have to have an accent, like Kim's Convenience. If it's a U.S. show, I often do not. They do not want an accent. And and a, part of it, I think, is the role, but a lot of it, I think, is this you know, uh, different expectation on the part of those two markets, which is that, you know, in Canada, um, we are, we celebrate our diversity, 
but our diversity is all through immigration. And so everybody who's not white is an immigrant which is not true either, right? <laughs> yeah. It's no more true than the American mentality, which is we celebrate our diversity, but everybody sounds American, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Neither one is true. No, it's not either. true. It's fascinating because um, I find that often when they're doing these things, people only have certain American accents. I'm from Iowa originally, so I don't have a discernible accent. I auditioned for a commercial years ago and they told me I didn't talk black enough. And right. I said, well, I'm black. Well, you don't sound the way um, someone sounds for, they told me I don't sound the way they think someone from Iowa thinks someone black talks. Again, well, I said, more, more I'm from, urban. Yes, yeah. I told them I'm from Iowa. And then the woman looks at me and she says, I want you to sound black the way someone from LA thinks someone from Iowa thinks black people talk. And she literally thought that was like a polite thing to say. And I was right. like, it, it's really right. not. Um, and I'm hoping that as time goes on, we'll have more diversity. I think it's really important that people of color and women of color are not only in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Because I'll watch a show and I can tell when they have a all white writer's room because right. I find that often when they do a, a Indian character or a black character or an Asian character, I think that they get the characters from watching other TV shows written by other white people. Right. And they're just these racial stereotypes. Have you ever gone on a set, and I don't want you to say any show's name, where you said, where you've been able to say as a writer, I suggest the character says this or talks like that. I've well, always been curious about I, I mean, that. You had, there's, there's a whole, yes, you, you know, I've often been, not often, but sometimes been in a situation where I recognize that this is not how somebody who looks like me would talk. <laughs> I mean, if it's an immigrant character, for example. And um, the, the trick is to, to try and br bring that knowledge to the powers that be in a way that doesn't make them feel stupid because then they'll go, yeah, whatever, you know, but you actually are trying to help the situation, right? So you have to find a, you have to find the right way to, to say that. And generally speaking, because I have the expertise of being from that community, usually people are willing to to listen now, and I do that with doctor parts too, because my family are doctors. You know, they wouldn't like like I remember. Um, you know, like like sometimes they want the they, they want a certain delivery because they think it sounds cool. And I say, yeah, but you realize that this patient is dying, and often when people get bad news, that I saw my dad do this. He would talk very slowly and very patiently because the person isn't hearing every word. They're like they're hearing every fourth word, and so. You know, and that's really a proper way to do it. And if you want an improper way to do it, I can do it your way. And they don't, they just want it, you know, they're just doing TV. And so I think, it, I think it's becoming on anybody who works in, in our business to bring the authenticity to the party. And authenticity is what I think elevates the material from being run of the mill to being something worth watching. And I think the audience craves authenticity. And the problem is, is, is <clears throat> when people think they're being authentic, but they aren't. And I don't think you have to be Danish to play Hamlet, you know? <laughs> it, like, like, the only thing you have to do is convince the audience that you're Danish, you know? Like Jerzy Kaczynski, the great writer once said, I don't have to jump out of an airplane without a parachute to write about jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. I just have to convince the reader that I have jumped out of an airplane without a parachute so that they believe what's happening. And that's really all that matters. You know, I, I don't cross any line saying, oh, only such a kind of person can do this. I'm saying, I've seen such a kind of person do it inauthentically too. You know, like it's not, you're not guaranteed authenticity just because you're the right gender or the right color or whatever, or the right, you know, whatever, you you have to earn your authenticity through through your, you know, your your knowledge, and your expertise and your execution of that. So so I think that's the challenge, is is being authentic, bringing that authenticity to the material to the to the show, 
and, and having the ability to then execute in a way so that the audience doesn't see the strings. You know, the audience just get, gets caught up in the story. So you've worked in a variety of genres from science fiction to children, to drama, to comedy. Is there a genre that you're really drawn to that's your favorite? Well, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I don't honestly see the difference in any of them. Um, you know, if you think I'm funny on Kim's Convenience, I swear to God, I'm not trying to be funny. You know, I am not trying to be funny. All I'm trying to do on Kim's Convenience is to be truthful. If you hate me on Transplant, I am not trying to be an asshole. I am just trying to be truthful as Dr. Singh. And, and within the context of each show, being true to that, the worlds of those shows. And so, like, I don't, I don't see, you know, I don't see Kim's Convenience as a comedy per se, though I realize it is, but I'm, I'm not trying to be quote unquote funny. And I'm not trying to be quote unquote dramatic on, on transplant. I'm really just trying to be truthful. And, and hopefully that the funny or the dramatic is in the writing and, and I'm elevating that as an actor and that does the job. Um, so if you ask me which I prefer, I will ask me to choose between kids. You know, I, it's, I, I love them both. And I'm, and I'm very thrilled that, I'm, that both Kim's Convenience and Transplant are running and I'm on both and they're completely different. And one's comedy and one's drama, as you point out, and I'm the same actor playing two different parts. And, and if people watch both shows, they're gonna see two very different performances. And, and I, I'm thrilled with that. Now, I know a lot of people are very passionately in love with Kim's Convenience hair. I know that I was super in love with the strain. I saw it at the, um, I saw the first episode at Comic-Con a couple of years ago. They, um, I feel like both of those shows out of some of the shows that you've done over the years, have a passionate following and fandom. Do you find that uh, people recognize you on the street? And when they do, is it from those shows or from some of your other past projects? Um, I think people have a short memory. So if I'm recognized, it's usually from Kim's Convenience or Transplant, the, the current things. Um, uh, I, I would say that, you know, Canada is not quite, uh, has the same sort of star <laughs> uh, system that you have in in uh, Hollywood and so people are a bit more blase about seeing people who are on TV walking down the street so I don't, I don't get I mean people recognize me but they don't care as much but uh, but it's it's great you know I mean in a way that's actually a good thing uh, because it, it enables me to just you know have a normal life like everybody else and and I and you need that if you're going to be an actor because the the more you know isolated you are from everyday life the less you have to draw on when you're actually playing a part because unless you're playing only famous actors it's going to be a tough one you know and I like the fact that you know on Kim's Convenience I was able to model some of my character from people I know in real life, the way the speech pattern, the way they talk, all that kind of thing. And I wouldn't know them in real life if I didn't have a real life. And I, and I think that's a good thing for, for anybody in the arts. So I saw that you have a few upcoming projects. Do you, do you feel comfortable talking about them? And sometimes I find some of the things that you've done, I don't have access to see in the US. Um, and so I think that you do some things that are like just in Canada and unless someone buys them in the US, uh, we don't always get a chance to see them because that movie you first described that you did uh, while you were still in school, I've never heard of it, but I love a good romantic uh, film. So I'm definitely gonna try and, and find it. Unfortunately, so you'd, find it. You'd, have to, you'd have to go to the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's archives to, to get oh. it. Um, so it's not, you know, it's so old and, and it's, you know, in their vaults somewhere, but it was so groundbreaking at the time. I, I mean, I saw it a couple, again, a few years ago and, you know, it, it's, it's aged in that the technical quality, you know, was shot on 16 millimeter film and optical soundtrack and, you know, that kind of thing. But, but the, the storyline for what it was, was really 
you know, it was what can quite, I mean, I don't even know if they did something like that today. You know, I, in fact, I suspect they've even forgotten that they did it. <laughs> yeah. years ago, it was so far ahead of its time. But, but you're right that uh, a lot of things that I do be based in Toronto, some of them are Canadian content and really only get into the United States through, you know, if there's a video on demand for a movie, they can sometimes get there. Um, but series, I mean, I was thrilled when Kim's Convenience uh, got on Netflix almost while it was still on here. Because as, you, as I mentioned with Little Mosque on the Prairie, that was a big show in Canada. And like I said, it was seen in 80 countries and nobody in the United States ever saw it until years later because it, there was no streaming when it was on. So um, yeah, I mean, it's one of these things like there's so much great content on now. You see these shows on Netflix from Israel and from India and from you know people you would never. And, and the other great thing about streaming is that my family in India and Singapore and other parts of the world who had heard that I worked in film and television but had never seen anything I, I saw now get to see what I've been doing <laughs> uh, because it's on Netflix India, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's a that's a great thing. Um, I don't know how to help you. I mean, I'll I, I, <laughs> the the, uh, the the cross border um, sales of of content are you know. We, we get everything that's seen in the United States, but I don't think the United States get everything that's seen everywhere else. No, we don't, because there's a show in Canada about a police officer with his dog that I desperately want to see. I, love. Yeah, I have a lot of friends who work on that show. It's shot in, it's shot in Newfoundland, and it's a lovely uh, uh, show, and it's a very successful here, and it's seen all over the world, but uh, I'm sure it'll start streaming sometime in the States. I hope so. I love dogs. And so the minute I saw there's a dog TV show on, I was like, doggy, I want to see the doggy. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a major dog nerd. Um, so if you could be on any TV show, what TV show would it be? Uh, huh. Well, uh, wow. I, uh, my, my, my favorite TV show is no longer on. That's the problem. I would have loved to have been on Veep. Uh, I love Veep. I love Veep. Um, I wanted to. I want to play Preet Bharara. If they ever make a movie about the Trump presidency, <laughs> Preet, Preet Bharara has a part in it. I want to play Preet Bharara on that. Um, I, I would say right now, I would love to be on uh, Brooklyn Nine. Uh, Brooklyn Nine. What is it? Brooklyn Nine. Nine. Yeah, I think it's Brooklyn Nine. Yeah, I wouldn't mind being on that. I think it's really great. Uh, just to be in the same room as Andre Brower would be uh, a big, you know, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, uh, and d dramas? Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I would love to be like the, 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 the um, you know, the murderer on a law and order. I, I think that would be, <laughs> that'd be great. I have a lot of friends in New York who've been on Law and Orders multiple times. You know, it's a it's an interesting show because it's been on so long. You see actors playing parts again and again, uh, and that happens in Canada too. I've been, I was on two different episodes of a multiple series playing two different characters, <laughs> you know, two seasons apart. Um, so yeah, like give me a Law and Order, give me a Brooklyn Ninety Nine. They're both shot, they're both cop shows. So I should probably find something else, but you know, I'll get back to it. I would love to see you in The Expanse. It is one of the few sci-fi okay. shows. All right, okay, now wait a minute. <laughs> if you want to talk about The Expanse, first of all, I have worked on The Expanse since the pilot. You have? Yes, but not on camera. Do you know what looping is? Looping is when all of the background voices, which are not recorded on the day, of course, because the principal actors are talking, right? So they record, okay. they record the principal actors talking here and all that huge crowd scene in the back, they're all miming, right? Oh. So in post-production, they have to go in and put in voices for all those people. Uh, and so they bring in what's called a loop group uh, of two or three, four or five actors who improvise the background voices for all of those characters, for all those people. Or they'll do the grunts and groans for a fight or whatever, all the sounds that you know aren't on, on camera, weren't recorded on the day. Anyway, 
I have looped The Expanse since the pilot, every episode. So I, I know that show really well. <laughs> I, I, I can improvise in Belter. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and I know all of that. And I don't know if I should tell you this. When does this show uh, get on? Um, it's coming in the US in the December. I mean, in December. No, 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 not The Expanse. I mean, this interview. Um, I was going to wait until the week of your episode um, coming up right. on well, the next time. I, 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 will, I will tell you that you should watch season five of The Expanse. Season five. Okay. That's the one coming up. When you say you want to see me on The Expanse? Yes. Well, then watch season five. Oh, you're in this. I didn't say <laughs> that. I didn't say that. I love The Expanse. I'm a major sci-fi fan. I think The Expanse is a fantastic show. I was a big fan, even if I didn't work on it, but trust me. It has, it like normally in sci-fi shows, I swear that there was a race war and all the ethnic people died because a lot of shows that I grew up watching, it was just white people. So I just secretly assumed, oh, well, we must have died off for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. But this is one of the few shows where it's not just black, a few black people and then the rest white people. They have um, Hispanic people, Asian people, people who look vaguely ethnic, but I'm not sure what they are. It's just visually so exciting. I can't believe you said show. you wanted me to be on The Expanse and I'm gonna be on The Expanse. I can't believe you told me, yay! Well, don't tell, but I'm not telling you what or when <laughs> or anything. And I've probably broken my NDA by even saying I'm, I'm in <laughs> I am in season five. Congratulations, I'm so happy. That show, I just, I love the show and I love the cast. I won't ask you anything about it. I will definitely reach out to you in December so we can talk about it once I see the episode. Um, but the other thing I wanna ask is, are you into superhero movies? And if you are, would you like to be in a superhero? Because I know your co-star from, um, Kim's Convenience is going to be a He's superhero. He's going to be a big, big superhero movie star. Simu Liu, yeah. Uh, sure, I would love to be in a superhero movie. I'm not as fit as Simu, though, so I don't know if I can fit into any of those costumes. But, um, you know, I, I love, I love, I love to work. And I don't see any difference between genre, between style, between, you know, any of that stuff. I, I, you know, you throw me a job and I will take it. It's really hard for me to say no, unless it's stereotypical or demeaning or, or sexist or something. But, uh, you know, without that, I'm there. So, you know, if you know anybody casting superhero movies, please, <laughs> please send them my name. I would totally send them your, na your name. And if you got cast, you know they make you get a dietitian and they make you work out and they torture you until you Well, I don't mind doing all of that. I just think <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm probably a bit long in the tooth for for the, the the superhero, but I could probably, you know, I'd be Alf, I'd be a good Alfred to to uh, to a, 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 a you know, South Asian Batman. Well, you know yeah. there are rumors that they are going to be doing um, a live action of the Batman animated series um, where Batman is old and he is mentoring a young Batman kid and the he's like Asian or mixed or something. Um, we're hoping that he'll get a live action movie and then he'll need his own Alfred. I'm there. <laughs> I love representation. I love seeing ourselves in uh, not only in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Thank you so much for talking with me. I cannot wait to see uh, the next episode of Transplant. And congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me.